Thanks, Zurinder. So, welcome you to the integration track. So, this track, uh, this session is on uh, how to adapt, uh, how to adapt a integration architecture which is cloud native and microservices friendly. So, in this session, I'll be covering several aspects of uh, integration and cloud native applications. So, the first one is uh, the the role of integration in converting your existing business into a digital business. And, and also, I'll also talk about the uh, role of integration in the cloud native architecture. And uh, in the process, I'll, un uh, I'll talk about some of the microservices integration patterns uh, that we have discovered uh, with our experience with uh, microservices applications. As well as, uh, finally, I'll cover how these patterns can be realized with the use of uh, WS2 integration platform. Okay, so let's get started with the session. So uh, now, if you look at uh, digital transformation, uh, so one of the key challenge in converting your existing business into a digital business is the integration. Right now, uh, if you take your enterprise, you have your own uh, internal systems, data, services, as well as you have your partners or customers' systems and services. Also, you have to integrate with any third-party web APIs or SaaS applications. So, integration plays a key role in converting your uh, conventional business into a digital business. So. When it comes to realizing digital transformation, cloud native applications also plays a key role. So before going into the details of uh, cloud native application development, let's have a look at what cloud native is. So uh, at very high level, we can define it as a methodology to build and running applications by leveraging the power of cloud computing. Right? That's a very, very abstract uh, definition. Now, if you look at some of the attributes of cloud-native cloud application, so uh, the first one is uh, a given cloud-native application is composed of uh, multiple microservices or serverless functions. So that means uh, when you are building a cloud-native application, you will be building independently uh, developed and designed microservices. Uh, alongside uh, any of the serverless functions. So once you have uh, this kind of uh, cloud-native application, the services or serverless functions that you have in cloud-native applications are packaged into containers. So that's where you, you again make your services independent uh, by having its own isolated runtimes. Uh, and also you leverage technologies such as Docker, Kubernetes, uh, for container management. And also, cloud-native applications runs on a continuous delivery model, which means uh, you can streamline your uh, design, development, testing, and uh, deploying into production. The entire life cycle is streamlined with the use of uh, CI-CD. And finally, uh, uh, usually this term is called like uh, the, the dynamic management. I introduced the term adaptive governance uh, because uh, when, you, when you are running a given cloud-native application, you have to either scale, it, scale up or scale down the uh, application runtimes based on your uh, input in the sense of uh, in, incoming traffic, uh, as well as you need to build some ecosystem around your applications uh, again, some uh, kind of a observability layer. And also, you need to have some kind of a feedback channel. So based on your consumption of your application, you may want to alter some of the behaviors of the application. So if you look at any of the cloud providers, like Google Cloud or AWS, they are actually having this kind of ad adaptive governance model in their cloud-native application uh, deployment architecture. So cloud-native applications are on the rise. Right. Uh, if you were there in the uh, keynote sessions, uh, uh, now most of the existing architectures are shifting towards a cloud-native architecture. As a result of that, most of the uh, components that you have in uh, cloud-native applications are also increasing, which means, uh, for example, uh, serverless and microservices, uh, you, you have to deal with so many serverless and microservices when it comes to realizing cloud-native architectures. So because of this, uh, now, 
what actually happened was uh, you, you used to have some kind of a monolithic uh, system and you segregated that into uh, either microservices or serverless functions and those, uh, uh, those microservices and serverless functions are connected to each other over the network, right? So what it means is uh, in integration of these cloud native applications and microservices is becoming the number one challenge in realizing cloud native architecture. So, so now, uh, if you are like, if you are from any enterprise background, you are used to have some kind of a central enterprise integration layer or ESP layer to integrate all your systems and services. Now, with the introduction of cloud native architecture, you basically have to segregate that, and microservices architecture fosters the elimination of, of ESP. With, uh, by introducing uh, the concept of a smart endpoint and dump pipes. So this is actually an, uh, uh, this must be a familiar diagram to most of you. So this is a typical enterprise service bus that is connecting multiple services and systems. So in this case, uh, you have uh, several systems and services that is connected using an ESP. An ESP also exposes some composite uh, functionality to its consumers. And at the ESP layer, we'll have some set of virtual services which contains uh, business logic as well as the inter-service communication, uh, resiliency, service discovery, as well as some of the governance capabilities. For example, observability is actually implemented at the ESP layer, which is connected to a separate observability layer. So this is the conventional architecture. Now, with the introduction of cloud native or microservices architecture, we are basically breaking this into uh, services. Now, uh, all the smarts that we had in the ESP layer is now segregated into different microservices. And these microservices are polygot, which means they you can leverage any of the existing programming languages. And now, the business logic as well as the inter-service communication logic must be part of these uh, services. And also, when it comes to governance and observability, again, the microservice developer has to take care of uh, all those things. So uh, this is actually a, uh, one of the key challenges in realizing microservices architecture. Uh, so integration of microservices need a better kind of a, you need to understand what are the available patterns for integrating microservices. Now assume that if you have like 100 services, this, will, this architecture will uh, become really verbose, right? So that's why we need to have some set of uh, integration patterns for uh, building microservices. Now this is not a pattern, actually, it's an anti-pattern. Uh, this is uh, one of the early implementation of uh, microservices. Uh, this is actually from Netflix one of the early implementation of their API gateway layer. So they used to have uh, uh, like uh, hundreds of microservices at their backend layer, and the implementation or the orchestration or composition of those services are taking place at the API gateway layer. So API gateway is virtually becoming the monolith, the new monolith. Right? So they actually realized this, uh, the pitfalls in this architecture. They later uh, uh, disaggregated the gateway layer into multiple uh, services. For example, the playback and the discovery are they are one of the commonly used APIs of Netflix. And then they, have, they had separate implementation of those APIs at the gateway layer. And another common pattern that we have seen is, uh, anti-pattern that we have seen was uh, using an ESB to integrate microservices, which is, which doesn't make sense. So how to integrate microservices? So let's go through some of the commonly used patterns that we have identified. Uh, so the first pattern is uh, active compositions or orchestration pattern. So in this case, uh, we need to identify different uh, microservices types as well. Now here we have uh, three different categories of microservices. The first one is the uh, core. So, so you were talking about how to integrate microservices, the integration patterns that we have 
to integrate microservices. The first pattern is uh, active compositions or orchestration pattern. So in this pattern, we uh, now we have to identify microservices with uh, different uh, granularities, right? So in this context, uh, we can. Uh, we can, we can identify three different types of microservices. The first one is uh, the core services or atomic services. Those services uh, uh, primarily address a specific business capability and doesn't talk to many other external systems. Basically, it's a self-contained service that doesn't talk to other services. And on top of that, you have uh, composi compositions or integration services. So those services actually talk to other, other microservices. So, uh, and on top of that, uh, you have uh, API services. So what happens is when, when you start building microservices architecture, you maybe start with the core services, and then on top of that, you build uh, composite business functionalities. And when you want to expose those business functionalities to your external consumers, you may want to expose that as a API. So that's where API services comes into the picture. And again, it's not a monolithic layer as what we have seen in the earlier slide. It's a fully segregated uh, micro layer. And again, those API services are maybe centrally governed. Uh, things such as throttling, uh, versioning, and observability may be connected, uh, done through a connected uh, control plane. And uh, the core concept behind uh, active composition is the synchronous messaging. That means you, have, you always have the request response type of messaging you send. So this is ideal for implementing services that are more interactive. Uh, like if you want to provide a more interactive experience to your users, you may be implementing this pattern. And also, uh, so the, the uh, microservices uh, the uh, implementation can talk to existing other systems like legacy or external uh, web APIs. So that is done through uh, this layer where, where you basically talk to uh, other systems using another service layer. So we'll come back to that later in the presentation. So the second pattern is the reactive compositions. In this architecture, we usually don't have a composite service concept. Rather, services are communicating with each other using an uh, event bus, such as Kafka or a message broker like any AMQP broker. And uh, so, uh, so, for example, order processing uh, system, uh, you usually place an order, so there is another, uh, so you basically when you place an order, it goes as an uh, uh, message which is uh, published into a particular topic and there can be multiple subscribers maybe shipment application uh, accounting application which has subscribed to that particular topic usually event bus implementation uh, uh, we can leverage uh, things like kafka and uh, and also one important aspect is if you uh, if you are familiar with message brokers they used to have a lot of business logic logic in it, right? Crouching and some kind of uh, various QoS uh, are already been part of these message brokers, especially MQP brokers. So we need to make sure that all the microservices, uh, the event bus is used as a pure dump messaging layer where all the business logic resides at the message uh, microservices layer. So for example, if you are using Kafka, you build most of your logic, like keeping offset, uh, handling different type of, types of messaging as part of your service code so that your broker is done. So there are a lot of uh, discussions around uh, microservices, which pattern to use. So we have to choose between active or reactive. So each pattern has their own uh, pros and cons. So if you look at active compositions, uh, it is again ideal for interactive services, but uh, Services are not autonomous. Uh, if I go back to the same diagram, if you take one of these uh, uh, microservices at the top, they are actually dependent on underlying microservices. So uh, it actually kind of violates the, one of the core principles of microservices, which is autonomous services. But you don't really have to worry about it as long as it matches your use case. 
uh, it's okay to use active compositions. And also reactive compositions, in, in many articles and books, I've seen uh, reactive microservices is positioned as the only way of doing microservices communication or interactions. Uh, but uh, again, it's ideal for asynchronous messaging, but uh, when it comes to composition logic, uh, it is not that visible by looking at the uh, services, right? For example, in this diagram, uh, you are one of your services publishing messages to the bus. There is another consumer. There is no place that you can basically deduce your integration or composition logic. You need to use complex observability tools around this kind of architecture to understand what's going, uh, understand the business logic behind your services. So the actual, uh, when, it's, when it comes to pragmatic usage of these patterns, I would say it's more or less hybrid architecture is more suitable because uh, you can leverage uh, best of both these patterns. Uh, so in this particular architecture, I have used uh, active compositions at top layer where you have API services. And then uh, at the middle, I have used asynchronous messaging uh, with uh, a broker or event bus which connects to all these systems. And uh, if you are trying to map this into the cell architecture that we have discussed in the morning, uh, either entire thing can be a cell or one portion of this can be a cell. So inside the cell you can use a broker and uh, build your communications. Uh, also in between cells you can build uh, either synchronous communication or asynchronous communication based on a, a broker. So the other aspect is, so this particular architecture, so we, talk about, we, we are talking about cloud native architecture, right? But when it comes to adapting this kind of architecture, you always have to deal with all the existing systems and services. So no enterprise is, is a greenfield enterprise. So therefore, uh, we, we can identify several patterns that helps you in converting your existing, existing uh, conventional architecture to a cloud-native architecture. So the anti-corruption layer pattern basically, uh, uh, so uh, suppose that you have two subsystems, uh, one sub subsystem uses the cloud native architecture, the other one uses the conventional monolithic architecture. So you can build an anti corruption layer between these two subsystems so that uh, for, to implement any of these functionalities in one of these subsystems, you don't have to change the other one. So th this layer actually doing all the transformations and all the uh, mapping between two different architectural styles. Uh, uh, as the anti-corruption layer. Now, if you are an enterprise who's trying to adapt cloud-native architecture, Strangler pattern is one of the very common one that you can uh, leverage. It's a very simple pattern. So that uh, the, uh, the foundation of this pattern is to uh, run your legacy architecture alongside your new cloud native architecture. So for example, suppose that you are starting a new project in your organization, then you can leverage cloud native architecture for that project. At the same time, you can use existing legacy systems. And there's a strangler facade that actually doing the, uh, we can say it's a routing between these two systems. So gradually you can, uh, you can see modern side is uh, increased. So finally, you can fully migrate to the uh, cloud-native architecture. This is kind of a gradual uh, migration from your legacy to modern architecture. So this is very common pattern that we have seen with most of our customers. So now we talked about several integration patterns using uh, microservices. So how you can use WSO2 integration platform to build uh, these patterns? To start with, now, uh, I'm sure most of you are like uh, most of you are leveraging existing enterprise integrator or ESB as part of your architecture. So you can still use that, and uh, as with this Strangler pattern, you can use uh, the technologies that we are offering in this space. Like Ballerina can be a great good candidate to build uh, this kind of integration microservices. Uh, so basically, you build integrations using Ballerina and, and also micro ESP, which is the one that we have released, uh, the lightweight version of uh, Enterprise Service Bus with most of its uh, f foundation features. Uh, so you can use that to implement these 
kind of micro uh, integrations. So the difference between Ballerina and micro ESB is Ballerina is a code-based approach, which means you are writing code to do the integration, whereas micro ESB, you are basically using the same WS3 ESB DSL uh, to implement the uh, logic, uh, but it's container native and container friendly. And on top of that, uh, you don't have to use a monolithic API gateway layer, but you can use API manager uh, with the micro gateway mode so that your, gate, your APIs are independently scalable units. Uh, along with the identity server. Okay, so, so any talk on uh, microservices integration is not complete without talking about service mesh. Uh, so how many of you have heard about this concept? Oh, I think pretty much everyone, right? Yeah, so, so one of the key reasons for the inception of service mesh is that uh, when we have uh, uh, inter-microservice communication, there are a lot of work that the service developer has to uh, taken care of. So, uh, for example, things like circuit breaking, service discovery, observability, the service developer has to take care of all those things. So, uh, the heart of the service mesh concept is that identifying these commodity features and implement them as a separate sidecar which runs, which runs alongside your service. So, uh, for example, if you look at this particular microservice, you have its microservices business logic. Uh, then you have the sidecar, which contains the uh, inter-service communication abstractions. And uh, sidecars are actually uh, controlled by a control plane. So, uh, and also we have uh, other capabilities inbuilt into the sidecar and the control plane, such as observability, throttling, uh, some types of routing. And we need to make sure that uh, some of the, these guidelines are followed when you are adopting microservices, uh, service mesh, because uh, service mesh is ma only meant to handle uh, non-business capability related uh, inter-service communications, which means uh, if you have a logic such as you, you have to call service A and service B, B, the communication logic is actually the business logic, right? You can only have uh, resilient communication abstractions as part of the service code, uh, as part of the sidecar, but service code must have all the business logic of the interaction. Uh, and also, we, we shouldn't, so that means we shouldn't implement any business logic as part of the service mesh uh, uh, sidecar. And uh, also, there are some limitations of the uh, uh, current implementations of service mesh, uh, because most of the time it only supports syn synchronous communication. And uh, in, in projects such as Envoy and Istio, there are some ongoing work related to synchronous messaging, especially bringing in something like Kafka, or any AMQP uh, brokers. So uh, again, uh, same. So when you are, suppose that you are adopting service mesh into the same architecture, you don't have to change any of these uh, uh, interactions. So the service mesh is kind of a in infrastructure-related component that you don't have to worry at the business logic level. So that is very important aspect of service mesh. It is kind of a uh, underlying platform that you get all the resilient capabilities out of the box. Okay, so with that uh, summarization of what we have discussed so far, so it is uh, the cloud native uh, shift is inevitable, so you have to prepare for that, you have to plan for that, and this kind of uh, uh, adaptive and iterative architecture is required to address most of the challenges in building cloud native architectures. And uh, microservices patterns, uh, again, the hybrid approach to implement microservices integration is uh, absolutely essential. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, so, uh, the, so repeating the question again, so his question was why we shouldn't use an ESB to implement a microservices integration, right? So the key aspect of that is uh, when you build, uh, if I go to the, if I go back to the same diagram, uh, so now in this particular case, 
So you can consider these services as microservices, the, uh, the services at the bottom, right? And so when you implement the integration at the ESB layer, what actually happens is you are putting uh, the business logic into a separate monolithic layer, uh, which means you have everything uh, in a single monolithic runtime. Uh, so you have every, every business functionality implemented into a single monolithic runtime. That means, uh, again, it violates the key principle of uh, microservices because uh, you, you are having your business capabilities in a single monolithic. So they are not independent. The, yes, routing, again, routing, uh, routing can be a business logic as well. right? If you are looking for a specific purpose, a specific parameter maybe, that again part of the business logic. But uh, non-business logic related routing uh, actually can be implemented at that kind of a, maybe a load balancing layer or some kind of a central layer. Yeah. What is the difference between ESB and the micro ESB that you shared in one of your slides? Yeah, that's a good question. <clears throat> so uh, his question was, uh, what's the difference between uh, micro ESB and ESB? So micro ESB is actually a, uh, it's a, this particular instance, it's an instance of microservice, micro ESB is a microservice, right? So what it means is you build the, so for example, in this particular diagram, microservices C is implemented on top of uh, micro ESB. So the business logic of microservices C has the interaction between service D, and that is implemented using our micro ESB. And, uh, but that is a single unit, single independent runtime uh, that doesn't contain any of the other integrations. So the entire thing can be a microservice. So that's the difference between a central and a micro ESB architecture. Can you speak up, please? Can you hear me? OK. So are you saying that in the micro ESB instance, there will only be only one service running? Yes. OK. So yes. that micro ESB is not a shared component. It's going to be just? Yes, that's correct. OK. So that, does micro ESB has all the EIPs with, built within it? Or we have to be in, I know, having an instance shared as separate? micro ESB for a particular kind? Because if I have all the EAPs built within it, then it's going to be like so much of wasted resources, right? Yeah, so, uh, so the underlying runtime provides the capabilities to build all the EIPs. But a given instance, you will be building a selected set of EIPs. So for example, this microservice C will use maybe a couple of EIPs. Uh, the underlying runtime. Uh, Although it provides all the capabilities, it's not a, uh, like a very heavyweight uh, runtime. I think the startup time is around five seconds, and memory footprint is a few hundred uh, megabytes. So you'll get the details later in, in a later presentation. But uh, conceptually, uh, it's two different approaches. If you are using any Ballerina or Spring Boot or any other microservice technology, that's a code-driven microservice. This is a uh, even a camel based like a camel runtime can be used to build this kind of a micro uh, uh, service which is running using a dsl yeah uh, one follow up question to his question that um, companies like us who host our our services in our you know our internal infrastructure mm -hmm. um, are we saying that this is not the way to go for that unless we, we, we plan to migrate our infrastructure in cloud? Because they are, it's, I won't say it's redundancy, but they are coming up with their own runtimes, right? Is it the optimal usage of, of our own infrastructure? Sorry, uh, you are currently on some kind of a cl cloud provider or? No, uh, we so own our servers. Your yeah. own cloud. Yeah. Right, so uh, that, uh, that actually depends on uh, what are the underlying, so to implement this kind of architecture, just forget the, the con conventional part for a second, uh, to make these the cloud native microservices, you need to have some kind of a orchestrate, uh, the docker or container layer, and on top of that, you usually need something like Kubernetes, 
uh, to get the full power of uh, this architecture. So uh, even if you have uh, the, this kind of a monolithic architecture, you can uh, migrate some part of your business logic into this architecture as long as your foundation platform provides Docker, Kubernetes, and all the other orchestration-related capabilities. So it, it's, there's no any limitation on that. Thank you. Yeah. I have one follow-up on this one. So in, in this case, we are using micro ESB as kind of a replacement for, let's say, Spring Boot. Micros, uh, ESB, or ba no, actually Ballerina is the r replacement for Spring Boot because Spring Boot, you are basically writing code. But it also, I mean, it has the server Tomcat within it, so it can just yes. start up the application. Yes. Here, micro ESB seems to be doing the same thing, right? Yeah. yeah. So it is going to be like one or the R, right? Yeah, it's, it's up to the user. So, for example, if you are, a, if you are fluent in WSO ESB configuration language, and you are not willing to m migrate to a separate technology, then you can stick to micro ESB approach. But if you are willing to try out Ballerina, and uh, if you have seen okay. the power of Ballerina, then you can build it as a Ballerina microservice. So, so when it comes to service mesh, yeah, this micro ESB is going to be on the data plane, right? I can't hear you. Sorry. Uh, in if we, if you talk about service mesh, yeah. So the micro ESB is not going to be on the control plane. It's going to be on the data plane, right? Yeah. So what's going to be in the control plane? Yeah, so in the service mesh, uh, so there is some overlapping features, right? If you look at even Spring Boot or Camel or Ballerina, things like circuit breaking is also part of the framework or the language. And also service mesh is providing that capabilities. So, uh, so it's, uh, when it comes to implementing this, you may move your circuit breaking logic out of your service code into the service mesh. And the control plane actually only controls the inter-service communication abstractions. It doesn't control anything related to the business logic. So, but at this API gateway, API uh, services layer, you may have another control plane kind of a uh, governance layer, which actually controls the business-related aspects, uh, like what is the throttling level for this particular API service. So that is not part of your inter-service or network communication logic. So we need to identify that differentiation because my, my, uh, service mesh only controls the network-related inter-service inter communication, whereas the API governance or API control plane actually controls something related to your business. So we need to have that isolation uh, clearly when it comes to this uh, kind of a hybrid implementations. So uh, I think we'll have to you know, take yeah. other questions later because we had some interruptions in the middle. Yeah. So thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you, Kasun. So, uh, so he'll be there.